Okay. Hi again, everybody. It's a very special day, a special afternoon. Um, sunny day, afternoon, a Saturday afternoon. So I'm really very pleased that so many of you are here for this um, initiative, which I think is a contribution of the diplomatic community of Oslo to this very, very important Oslo Forum, which is really gaining momentum. When you say contribution of the diplomatic community, I'm thinking of uh, what happened yesterday at the Canadian residence with uh, our uh, American friends also involved. What happened yesterday evening at the French residence uh, with the uh, help, of course, uh, of uh, our French uh, colleagues. So, in a way, I really hope that uh, this uh, third initiative, in a way, would uh, pave the way to uh, even closer cooperation of our diplomatic community with uh, uh, the Oslo Forum. And really wish to seize the opportunity to thank Ambassador Arthur Dilczynski, the Canadian Ambassador yesterday, who was very uh, supportive also to disseminate our initiative, and His Excellency Ambassador Jean-François Dobel, who is honouring us with his uh, physical presence this afternoon, which was really, again, kind enough to talk about this initiative yesterday during the beautiful event in his residence. Monsieur Ambassador Dobel, Bonjour, merci, merci, and bonne fois, merci. And of course, I'm thinking of yesterday evening at your residence, Ambassador Dubel, because uh, Tu Halbuschen, the CEO of the Oslo Forum, mentioned an important book written by Montesquieu, L'Esprit des Lois, The Spirit of Laws. And law, it, it is what it is all uh, about uh, tonight. I'm thinking of Aristotle, a great philosopher, who said that man is a political animal. Homo est animal politicum. That means that a man, a woman, a man, a human being is really such only in society. And the highest expression of a man, of a mankind, as such, are on the one hand the law, on the other hand politics. Really, the two things, law and politics, hand in hand, are again the essence of man in, uh, in uh, society. And this afternoon we're going to talk exactly about law and politics and maybe about the relations of the two. Law is created by politics, but politics is guided and checked by law. And let's remember that in the end what really counts is the individual, the rights of the individuals, the rights which are enshrined in the French uh, Enlightenment. So, we are here in an Italian institution and of course I would also like to say a few words about the Italian contribution to law, to the progress of law, to the progress of rights and to the progress of uh, human uh, rights, as all other countries in the world can do. Uh, first of all, I would like to say just one word about the European Union, of which no, uh, Italy is a member, uh, and which has extremely close ties and connections with uh, Norway. Law, human rights, the rule of law are quintessential in the uh, European Union. Uh, the European Union is based on the rule of law and no candidate country can join the European Union without being a member of the European Convention on Human Rights. This is a message which we try to continue to stress uh, at length during the events to celebrate the 60th anniversary of establishment European economic community 60 years ago in my own uh, uh, country, Italy. And I'll come into Italy. Um, Matteo Fazzi, the director of the Cultural Institute, who is our kind host tonight, mentioned some contributions. With your indulgence, I will uh, repeat them. I would say one important contribution of Italy to our uh, area tonight is Roman law. The great contribution of the Roman Empire was uh, law, together with architecture and maybe with, uh, with the language. Roman law, which evolved into the Ius Comune, the common European law, and which in a way is still up and running today because it's still current law in the tiny little state of San Marino. Uh, there is one thing I remember from my young days as a student of law at the University of Padua, that's the Roman law considered the protection of minors, which was extremely sophisticated for dating back to 2,000 years. So perfect that it was called something usque ad unguem picta, that means um, like a statue uh, taken care of uh, 
until the nail, because you know when a sculptor made a statue, the finishing touches were so delicate that he had to work with his nails. So that was the protection of miners in, in Roman law. Then I would like to mention Marsilius. Marsilius was a political writer from Padova, from my city of Padova, 14th century, uh, who wrote that the authority of making laws belongs to the whole body of citizens. It sounds revolutionary even today, but even more so in the uh, 14th century. And something about the abolition of the death penalty, somebody much better than I, Antonio Stango, will talk about that. The first small state in Europe where the death penalty was abolished was in central Italy, Tuscany, at the end of the 18th uh, century. Uh, I could mention the Italian uh, penal and civil codes of the uh, 19th century in which also the death penalty was banned, so much so that when the King of Italy was uh, killed in uh, the year that was the 31st of March in the year 1900, uh, the culprit was apprehended immediately, he was sentenced to lifelong imprisonment, but not to the death penalty, and that was 120 years ago. Uh, finally, the fight against the death penalty, in which Italy is the forefront in the United Nations, in other, in other arena, and on that Antonio will uh, later. Now, three things. The first is to thank Antonio, to thank Ula, to thank Sophie for their contributions, uh, to which I'm really looking forward. Uh, then, uh, uh, I hope, uh, which is maybe within reach, this is again uh, to develop this cooperation with the diplomatic community in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Oslo, uh, with the Oslo Freedom Forum. And finally, uh, this is a long-term hope. You know, the title of uh, our event tonight is a Latin one. Omnium causa, omne ius constitutum es, which means literally every law or all law has been created for the sake of man. That term, every, all, is in brackets. In the Latin version, omne is in brackets, because the reality is that not all laws, existing laws, are perfect and are meant to serve the cause of the human beings. There are cruel, inhuman laws, bad laws, which you have to fight. So my hope is that with our very modest contribution tonight, with the efforts of the Oslo Freedom Forum, maybe in some years, in some times of years, or whenever in the future, we will be able to delete those brackets and really be able to say that all, every law, has been created for the sake of man, for the sake of individuals, for the sake at all of each one present here. Thanks so much for uh, you know, your uh, bearing with me, and really now I'm going to leave uh, the floor to the director of the Culture Institute, uh, to Antonio, to Ula, and to Sophie for their keynote speeches of tonight. Many thanks. to be here and to, to everybody. And thanks to the also Freedom Forum that I had already the pleasure to attend the last year. Uh, as a Italian ambassador mentioned, I used to be the coordinator of the Sixth World Congress against the Death Penalty that took place in Oslo last June. And uh, I took also the opportunity, coming here month after month to organize everything, to attend the also Freedom Forum. So I think that uh, I will be returning also for the next uh, edition because there is a, a real need of a, a, a forum like this. Uh, I, I have been the coordinator of the World Congress against the death penalty. The World Congresses uh, take place every three years, so I don't know who will coordinate the next one and in which city it will be, perhaps in Brussels or in another part of the world. But now I am in charge of another interesting organization that is the Italian League of Human Rights. Uh, this is uh, interesting for me because uh, it is the most uh, ancient Italian organization for human rights. It was founded in 1919. I was not there yet. <laughs> uh, but uh, 
it is also uh, a member of the International Federation of the League of Human Rights. And so this means that uh, uh, it gives me the opportunity to be in contact uh, and in cooperation with some 160 NGOs from uh, really all over the world. Some of them uh, work in a, a free political environment, some of them have uh, to, to fight, to struggle for human rights and for freedom in a political context where it is even forbidden to organize public events, uh, where there is no freedom of expression, no freedom of association, uh, not mentioning freedom uh, of uh, taking part in the elections and changing the government. So human rights nowadays is uh, uh, actually a matter of struggle probably in most of the countries of this planet. Although, of course, there have been progresses. Some of the progresses took place exactly in the field of the abolition of the death penalty. As Ambassador Novello mentioned, uh, it is a long story. In the modern age, it comes from uh, the, the work of Cesare Beccaria in 1764, from the abolition of the penalty in the then Grand Duke of Tuscany in 1786, then uh, in the United Italy, in the Kingdom of Italy, the abolition was inserted in the, the criminal code, Codice Zanardelli, in 1899. Unfortunately, we are the fascists, and so it was re-established the penalty for a while, but again and definitely abolished with the Constitution in 1948. 1948, as everybody of you remembers, is also the year of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And still, uh, there was uh, no mention of the death penalty in, in that document. But uh, in uh, other international uh, documents, in other international covenants, there are several uh, mention about the fact that uh, it should be abolished one day all over the world. The, the wording may differ from one international convention and another, but there is a clear trend established in the um, international law uh, toward a worldwide abolition. To this end, I have also the, the honor to take part and to be one uh, member of the board of another NGO that is uh, uh, Ends of Cain. Uh, it is based in Italy from 1993, uh, and although it was founded in, uh, in Brussels, because it's an international organization, and uh, the main idea was to arrive uh, at the level of the UN General Assembly uh, to vote in favor of a, a universal moratorium of the executions. So we had uh, to do a big work in many countries. We got uh, from the very beginning the strong support of the Italian government, then of the French government, then of all the European Union, and little by little we involved other governments in every continent because of course it is not a matter of being European to abolish the death penalty. Uh, and so we got the, the synergy with many other countries in the world. And the first time such a, a resolution for the Universal Moratorium of Executions was approved by the UN General Assembly was in 2007. Uh, then, uh, year after year, other resolutions have been uh, uh, voted and we noticed uh, an increase of uh, votes in favor of uh, the resolution and a decrease of votes against. From several years, this resolution is um, at the attention of the General Assembly every two years. The last time was last uh, December. And uh, we managed, in a very difficult situation, uh, not to have less votes in favor. I mean, a very difficult situation because, as you may have noticed, there are some countries where uh, steps back have been made in the last few years. One such country is the Philippines. Uh, you probably know that the, the current uh, president uh, uh, 
is uh, strongly not only in favor of, of the death penalty uh, sentenced by a tribunal, by a court, but even about uh, executing people in the street uh, uh, by um, armed patrols of police uh, or even uh, of uh, citizens, voluntary citizens, so called. So, this is uh, an example of a very bad trend that opposite of what happened in the last uh, 10 years until, uh, until now, uh, we noticed in some countries. On the other hand, the positive news is that uh, in 2016, five new countries abolished the death penalty. So, uh, no country reintroduced the death penalty, from 2007 at least, uh, several countries uh, abolished the death penalty from uh, that time, five in 2016. Some of the <coughs> states within the United States abolished the death penalty uh, meanwhile, such that uh, indeed there are only six uh, states uh, of the United States that currently execute the death penalty, and the number of executions is uh, uh, of uh, a few tons every year. Of course, we know a lot about this because thanks to the freedom of expression <laughs> and thanks to the movies, uh, we can know a lot about what happens in America. But there are countries where the situation of the penalty is kept almost secret. We have also to, to struggle to get news from what happens uh, there. There are countries uh, where even the families of people that are executed uh, are not allowed to receive news about uh, the, what happens to their relatives, uh, where the bodies are not given back to the family after the execution. And not to mention that uh, in some of such countries, uh, the execution takes place not only for uh, the most uh, uh, violent uh, crimes, as the international law, uh, would uh, tend to uh, impose, but also for political crimes. Uh, it has the crimes uh, without victims, uh, for uh, sexual behavior, for instance, or for uh, not uh, wearing properly uh, some clothes that are defined as compulsory by the respective regimes. So there is still a, a long way to, to walk for the uh, abolition of the penalty worldwide. And uh, anyway, we believe uh, that the, the idea of a moratorium is uh, a, a very good tool to use. It can allow in several countries the, the public opinion, where public opinion exists at least, to, to discuss uh, the issue. It can allow in some countries the parliament, where the parliament exists. To, uh, to change little by little the criminal codes and, uh, and so on. So the moratorium we consider a tool in view of the complete abolition in, uh, in several countries. Then I would like to add something about the general human rights uh, situation. The, the title of the event uh, of today that uh, I guess has been uh, indicated by Ambassador Novello because I know he simply loves uh, Latin terminology uh, in uh, law. <laughs> so the, the title of, of today is about uh, the fact that uh, the law uh, is or should be uh, for the benefit, for the sake uh, of uh, all human beings on all the main I suppose everybody knows this uh, other uh, and basic Latin sentence uh, in law according to which ubi uh, societas ibi us, so where there is a society there is a law. Um, of course there is a law and law, a uh, law can be different. There is also the, the so-called law of the stronger. Huh? <laughs> So when somebody speak, uh, speaks about uh, the traditional law or the traditional society uh, or even a traditional family, uh, comes always to my mind uh, the, the imagine of a, a very traditional society, a very traditional family, 
where the stronger one uh, usually a man uh, just uh, uh, takes uh, the, the weaker one by beating uh, uh, with uh, a stick on her head and brings uh, in some grotto and this uh, is the, the establishment of, of a traditional family. Uh, what I want to say is that uh, not always uh, the, the tradition uh, is uh, the type of law that we, at least we human rights defender, consider the best one. So uh, the point is the evolution of the law. Uh, law is established for the sake of mankind because, of course, a law is always better than the, the chaos or the anarchy, but it has to be um, subject to evolution. When a regime pretends that uh, there should be no evolution in the law, in the juridical system, in the society at all, because this is traditional, because it is the, the so-called regional approach to the universal human rights. Uh, this is something that uh, most human, human rights defenders, and uh, for sure me, uh, consider uh, not correct. Uh, consider a, a violation of the important uh, principle of the universality of human rights. Um, it is not for case uh, that the Declaration of 1948 is called the Universal Declaration. And uh, uh, one of the interesting topics from uh, several years uh, in uh, international law concerning the human rights is exactly this point. Universalism of human rights versus relativism or regional approach. I have to notice that uh, this uh, idea of regional approach uh, doesn't come normally by some uh, independent uh, scholar or by some independent human rights defender. <coughs> But uh, it, there is such a case that this idea comes always uh, by regimes uh, that systematically violate human rights, that have no ideas whatsoever to be changed uh, by elections, for instance, and, and they find that uh, this idea is very comfortable to, to pretend to have been uh, put on their thrones by some superior entity or by the tradition uh, forever and ever. Well, uh, this is a topic that uh, I, I would like to, to propose to your kind attention and I'm sure there would be a lot of discuss about this. One of the things I did uh, in my, let's say, 35 years uh, uh, activities for, uh, for human rights. So I was not there in 1919, but uh, <laughs> in, uh, at least from 1982 I started to work on human rights. And uh, uh, one uh, of uh, my main uh, ideas was to help people fighting for their own rights in every country, in every uh, place of the world where they cannot, uh, without uh, being uh, harassed or arrested, tortured, and uh, in some cases even executed. Because, you know, it is uh, relatively easy to, to work uh, for human rights in a country like Italy or in France uh, or in Norway. Um, it is still uh, relatively easy in the United States, I don't know in a few years, but uh, I suppose uh, yes. Uh, but, uh, uh, and this is uh, the reason why the, the Freedom Forum is important, uh, to give the possibility to people to express themselves uh, in an international forum, to come and report about what happens in that country, to go in uh, intergovernmental uh, forum and to take the floor and to speak and to denounce the abuses of their regime. This is something that uh, we of the human rights community uh, 
should go um, uh, and more and more do. I have been uh, uh, many times uh, at the, the UN Human Rights Council in Geneva. I, I had also the pleasure to meet uh, some of you there. Uh, some people that uh, will be in these days in Oslo for the Freedom Forum, they, they attend uh, sometimes uh, the uh, international event of human rights uh, in uh, Geneva in spring. And, uh, and I must say that uh, it is sometimes embarrassing to see how some of the worst regimes uh, on our small planet uh, sit there and uh, pretend uh, to impose their point of views of uh, human rights, uh, intimidate the human rights defenders that, uh, according to the UN rules, have the right in that uh, forum to take the floor with uh, certain limitations, of course, uh, and so on. Unfortunately, my impression, and I am not diplomatic in this moment, so uh, your excellencies will uh, <laughs> excuse me for this. My impression is that uh, the um, UN Human Rights Council uh, is uh, sometimes something that works against human rights instead of working in favor of human rights. <coughs> this, uh, in spite of the best intentions of most of the um, representatives of democratic states there, you know there have been some, uh, some states uh, that voted uh, to admit uh, in some uh, important uh, commission uh, of the UN Human Rights Council, uh, some states that uh, are, are well known as uh, egregious violators of human rights. I think we should do more uh, for this. I think we should do more to uh, allow the international system, the UN system, to really uh, behave according to the international human rights. But it, I don't want to take uh, too much a long time. Uh, nor you would uh, allow me for this. Just uh, um, to say something more about uh, the, the positive role that uh, uh, Italy, together with uh, other European countries, uh, played in, uh, in the last period uh, and going back even some centuries ago, no, not so far like in the Roman time, uh, I would uh, mention, for instance, that uh, Two very important things uh, have been achieved uh, in the last uh, 10 years, or a little more, no, let's say in the last 20 years now. Uh, one I mentioned before is the resolution on moratorium that uh, has been presented and is represented in the year now, but the other one, uh, even more important, uh, is uh, the institution of the International Criminal Court. And this allows me to return to the point of the title of our meeting. Because what is the law, even the best possible law, when there is not a sanction, when there is not a, a jurisdiction, when there is not a tribunal, a court that may um, consider responsible somebody that can do a trial, and if it is the case, to, to give uh, a punishment. So the, the international uh, juridical system was lacking an international court that could uh, judge the crimes against humanity, the war crimes and the crimes of genocide, wherever committed, in whenever moment after the, the creation of the court uh, and uh, the ratification by the states. Um, there had been the, uh, the special tribunal in Nuremberg and in Tokyo to judge uh, the um, crimes uh, committed by the, the German and uh, the Japanese uh, forces uh, during uh, the Second World War. But uh, it was, uh, uh, there were two tribunals of the winner against uh, the one. The history had to do also those steps. But there was not uh, a universal jurisdiction. Then there were the ad hoc tribunals. 
the judge of the crimes committed during the, the war and the, the conflict in the former Yugoslavia and in Rwanda. Okay. It was a very good positive steps. But again, they were only for some years and a very particular uh, geographic area, let's see. So Italy had uh, the, the important role to be on the first line to promote the institution of the International Criminal Court. And, uh, and that's why it is called the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, what was approved in Rome on 17 of July 1998. As you know, the court now sits in the Hague, and, uh, and this is something very positive. But there is always some but. It is more potentially positive than actually positive. Uh, you know that uh, it's been very difficult to bring to the Hague people um, to be submitted to the trials. Um, only few cases have been really discussed, only few, very few sentences have been really issued there. And then, it is a story of a few months ago, there are even some countries that uh, having ratified the Rome Statute, uh, withdrew from the Rome Statute, such as uh, think in Burundi or uh, the South Africa and uh, so on. So this is to say, that even when we finally make some very positive steps in the con construction of uh, uh, the international human rights law, these steps are not forever. And uh, these steps don't mean that uh, the rights and the law will be really completely and uh, wherever implemented. And uh, steps back can always be done. So the, the last consideration, um, I said that I, I would uh, have mentioned also some cases of some centuries ago. It was, uh, uh, again, um, an Italian professor in 1588, Alberico Gentili, who wrote uh, some books, of course in Latin, uh, De Iuri uh, Paci et Belli. So, the right in peace and in war. This is considered to be at the origins of modern international law. Um, what is interesting that he couldn't uh, publish it in Italy. He was uh, suspected, uh, especially his father was suspected to be a heretical, and there was a, a, a bad fashion in that time uh, in Italy as well as in other countries. So, for the suspicion of being a heretical, somebody could be uh, bored uh, alive. It happened to Jordan Broom, it happened to others. And so, his family moved to England, where there were also other kind of problems, but at least. Uh, he could work well in Oxford and to publish in Oxford his books that are now considered to be at the origin of modern international law. So my last point is we all have the responsibility to help, to support people that can give incredible inputs for the progress of all the mankind and specifically for the progress of human rights but uh, that in their own countries may still be in prison, tortured and killed just for their ideas. So thank you so much. Thank you very much for uh, your very good uh, contribution. I would like now uh, to, uh, to leave the floor to uh, Let's talk, I think that you can have a seat now if you don't mind, because uh, I think that it's time now to focus a little bit uh, on the forum itself. So I would like to, to leave the floor to, to your brother. <laughs> 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 you can 
to yeah, facilitate okay. a bit of the activity of the, of, of the Osmo Center. Thank you, thank you. Uh, ambassadors, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, first of all, I want to say how much we appreciate the contribution from the uh, international community and the um, <coughs> diplomatic community in, uh, in uh, Oslo. Uh, the Oslo Freedom Forum was started in 2009. Uh, with a, this crazy idea of establishing a center for, um, with an aspiration to tear down the walls and build, build the towers from Oslo. Uh, it started small, it has, we have built it over years, we have struggled, <coughs> um, we, it has been an uphill struggle and then it has been smooth. Um, next year we have 10th anniversary and we are now looking forward to like build it <coughs> even more and we are exporting it. So <coughs> we already have a freedom forum in San Francisco, which is um, more a uh, focus on the, the, the tech world. Uh, there is a close connection between technology and um, human rights. Uh, the tech industry are producing um, or creating many of the tools which benefits human rights uh, 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 activists. They are also on the other side. They are behind many of the tools which can control control and, and for surveillance. And this is a dilemma that we are discussing and that we are inviting the uh, tech world. So on Monday, we will have a, uh, a tech lab down at the Continental Hotel where we take up these issues and we also look into I mean, how to uh, create a better world also through technology. This year's forum has the, uh, the, the title or the topic uh, Defending Democracy and as the ambassador uh, pointed out, um, democracy um, for me when I was young, <coughs> many years ago, um, we experienced this third wave of democracy. We thought that I mean, the future was bright, that every country in the, country in the world, that I mean, the Cold War was over, uh, that we uh, could foresee a world with only democratic countries. It hasn't turned out that way, and now we are at least, it's a standstill. And we also see that undemocratic um, forces are um, on, on their moves forward. Um, we do acknowledge, um, and that's back to this topic, that uh, democracy and the rule of law uh, and strong institutions is the basic, uh, not only for democratic rights but also for human rights. We do believe that um, human rights cannot be respected without a uh, participation, participation, yeah, yeah. <laughs> difficult world, <Word. laughs> difficult world as well. So, um, um, with this topic this year, I am so grateful that we had, have, has, have been able to assemble so many of the democratic countries uh, in, in the world uh, to help us and to assist and to uh, uh, cooperate with us. Um, if we are to achieve uh, what I've started with, uh, to break the walls uh, or tear down the walls and build the towers, we also need alliances. And the best alliances we can have is uh, the support from the democratic countries in the world. So that was all I wanted to say. And I hope to see as many of you down at the Oslo Freedom Forum uh, we have already started on the speakership line uh, in front of the, the parliament uh, with public arrangements. And um, then for Tuesday and Wednesday, we have all the speeches, the wonderful speeches. So you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, sorry for keeping you waiting, Gula. We have now Gula, uh, which is the member of the Parliament and the leader of the Liberal Party. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I thought that we tried to keep it in the family. <laughs> that can sound very wrong in many countries. Um, but, um, Ambassador.
ambassadors. And uh, thank you very much for being invited here to the, um, the Italian institutions. Also, thank you very much for the reception yesterday in the French Embassy. Um, my name is Ola Elbuslund. I, I chair the Committee on Energy and, Envi and Environment in the Norwegian Parliament, but I'm also deputy leader of the Liberal Party. Um, and I, th I think I've tried to support the uh, Oslo Freedom Forum also from the beginning, uh, nine years ago, which I think is a, it's a, it's a forum that is very important for Oslo, which is also my constituency, but also important for Norway and also it's growing to have a role in the rest of the world and it's definitely something that we should support. Uh, then back to the topic uh, about uh, the abolition of uh, capital punishment and death penalty, which of course has been a struggle for throughout many years, it was mentioned uh, earlier on from Italy in the, in the abolition in uh, Florence. In uh, Norway, the last public peacetime execution was back in 1876. Uh, that was also, a, and, it, and it was a public execution, and a shocking execution. Uh, they say that a lot of people, when they were there, they fainted. Uh, and it started a debate, and started a, a strong debate uh, for many years. So it took almost 30 years from that last execution until uh, the death penalty was abolished in Norway in 1905. And then of course you had a, a longer debate that, so that the wartime abolition of the capital punishment came in 1979. We also of course had execution after World War II, as in many other countries, that was also contested, but it happened also here. And then, as, uh, late, uh, as in late uh, in 2004, we got the constitutional ban from the death penalty in, uh, in Norway. So here too, even though they, they say there has been a ban since 1905, it's still a discussion that has been there for a long time. And internationally, uh, last year, I checked the numbers, you had 1,032 known executions internationally, that is a little lower. Than it, uh, than, than it was previous years. I think 2015 was a high point. Uh, and was mentioned uh, that we now have, I mean, the most countries have abolished the death penalty. There are 50, but still 58 countries or territories are left that still has it. And of course, a, it's a uh, cluster of support for capital pun punishment in authoritarian regimes. Uh, most executions happen in uh, China, in uh, Saudi Arabia, Iran, also in Pakistan. Uh, last year, and it's been for many years, these are the countries that are consist consistently in the high rank. And I think as I was to talk a little bit as a parliamentarian, politically, I mean the, the fight against capital punishment in authoritarian regimes, of course, is a more general struggle for human rights and freedom and liberty in, in these countries. And for a country like Norway, uh, a lot of other democratic countries, of course, this debate on how they, uh, they have a relation with authoritarian regimes, it often becomes a discussion of what are your economic or broader political interests and what and how can you behave and, and, and have a relationship also to build on and develop uh, human rights. And these discussions are constantly there. And of course they also divide parties and they divide politicians within parties, as they do in, uh, in Norway. The last, uh, the, not the last example, one example here is of course uh, our relation to China. I mean, you had the Nobel Peace Prize given to Lu Xiaobo back in 2009. Of course, it is something that Nobel the committee, uh, they, they do on their own. It's not part of any political discussion within Norway, but it's done. But the reaction for China was very strong. So, uh, Norwegian politicians in many ways have been banned from China so, uh, since. I used to be vice mayor in Oslo for, for environment and transportation. I couldn't get a visa to, to China uh, a few years ago. The only reason was that it was, as I said, the last time, the last time, the, the day the plane was leaving, that was just not authorized in Beijing. And that's it. And 
Now Norway, of course, has had a political. Both this government and previous government has worked hard to normalize our relationship with China. Uh, and has finally made it. This year, a prime minister went to China with a large entourage uh, and really, as I, the Chinese have an expression that they say that they, you have to kowtow. That means that you have to really show respect uh, to such a degree that you bend down and your head reaches the floor. Uh, and this is definitely something that also our government did. I mean, we have an agreement uh, with them, but it's definitely not a, it's not a level agreement. It is a agreement where we accept that we will not behave in a such a way that we that we uh, we will um, criticize key Chinese interests. And is that the right thing to do against an authoritarian regime that has the highest numbers where they have uh, the capital punishments, where you really have a strong repressive regime? Yes, it's a, it is an economic interest, but uh, is, it, is this the right way to behave over such a regime? I definitely do not, I do not think so. I think it would be better if we had kept our principles high. Uh, and economically, we, it doesn't really matter. We have a relationship with China, and I'm not guilty against the relationship. But I think we are uh, bending over too far. Uh, and it's uh, something that, uh, that you should have a more principled attitude towards. And it's not only this is China's so very strong uh, position, uh, but also you can see the same thing in the, whether it's Saudi Arabia, where we have a free trade agreement. Uh, the EFTA countries has a free trade agreement. But we, and we have a very, it's a quite simple free trade agreement. It doesn't contain any uh, uh, environmental issues. Uh, I don't think it contains any political demands. Uh, and there is now a, a, and should be, a process where these agreements should contain more uh, of value-based uh, content. As you say, uh, one example is of course the TTP, which uh, by um, that uh, uh, Hillary Clinton called the gold standard of free trade agreements which is quite right. It was the gold standard of free trade agreements, where you have a lot of, uh, whether it's interest of uh, labor interest, there's uh, environmental interest, there's uh, human rights interest built into the free trade agreement. Uh, that could have been a start of something new, I think, when, these, when it comes to these agreements. Of course, that has been thrown away by Mr. Trump. And we are back here a little bit to square one. Uh, even though uh, the European Union, of course, is an entity that is in the forefront also to building up to have more, the, to put more uh, values into these agreements for uh, them to be to be implemented. Uh, so the, the capital punishments between authoritarian regimes and the struggle against them how to be put into a much broader uh, issue when it comes to how do we influence these countries uh, to have respect for human rights and also that also that includes the capital punishment. More difficult or different, or not more difficult, but different is it of course with democracies that still have uh, and, and uses the death penalty, whether it's the US or it's uh, uh, India or it's Japan. Um, where we can, where we must, as parliamentarians and politicians, work differently. I think also that in the time we have now, uh, as was mentioned, you have in, I think it's in, uh, in the EU, it's in Article 2, that the, uh, there is a, the, the ban on death penalty. Uh, and of course, when you look at the, the opening up after, as was mentioned, the, the dream of democracy that really uh, was really building up during the early 1990s. Uh, and the importance of such a strong commitment for uh, banning the, uh, the death penalty within the EU had had an enormous uh, effect as the Eastern European countries opened up and then finally also became part of the EU. And today, if you build on to that, you look at also the commitments that you have to uh, have on banning uh, the death penalty within the, within the country.
Council of Europe. This is also something I think is, are being tested now. You have one test, there's no doubt that this commitment, in, at least in my mind, is the only reason that the country like Russia has not um, uh, executed anyone for the, for the last 10 years. There's no doubt that it, it is this commitment that, is, that it has the effect that uh, they are still holding back, back. And definitely the way it is now, after the, uh, after the, uh, the, uh, the situation in, uh, in Turkey, first when uh, the, the coup at first, and then of course this well-planned counter-coup <laughs> that has been going on afterwards, uh, I mean, they got a reason, and then you really have had a, a counter coup that's been going on. And without the relationship with the EU, without the European Council, I think there's no doubt that Erdogan would have introduced the death penalty again a long time ago, or there would be no doubt that he would do it. But these institutions are the only thing that are holding back. Uh, and it's important to build on those agreements. And I don't know how it is internationally. Uh, the, the processes that, that are going on within the African Union or other broader uh, institutions, and if, if there is a possibility also to build up these agreements, I think that is something that it shows that it, when it's possible to build it in, over time it also is very important uh, that it really affects the change in. Uh, in, uh, in countries. I think one of the last six countries that's abolished the death penalty was Mongolia, which of course, co not coincidentally, then also uh, becomes the newest member in the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Which is also the, the reason they, the they, they do it. So these international institutions are very important. Uh, and within democracies, it's not only a debate about whether you should have capital punishment or not. It is, of course, also the scope of them. Uh, you, from states in the United States, you have whether juveniles can be executed or not. You have uh, uh, people with intellectual disabilities. They have this discussion, can you move and, and limit the scope of capital punishment? That you have the inherent discussions about whether uh, either there are uh, hidden or there are open the, um, discrimination. Is there a, uh, a side effect to this that, uh, like in the US, is most of the blacks that are executed, and this can also be many other uh, places. Uh, and it's, it's also, that's one also example, is of course. The, what are the state of the rule of law in countries where there is capital punishment? Uh, just a few days ago, we got the Norwegian citizen uh, Joshua French, that finally was free and came back from uh, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, um, and, and has been twice sentenced to, to death uh, there. And then it's uh, the discussion here too is that. Yes, we have used a lot of resources to get him back. And I think it's very right to use those resources. Uh, because there is a, a country that, if we do not use this, I mean, he will certainly he could die there. And it's not also really about what happened back, uh, back uh, in 2009, 2008. It's also about what kind of rule of law do we have in the, in the Congo. And if you go to Freedom House and check the Democratic Republic of, of uh, Congo, when it comes to the rule of law, they give a score of zero. Mm -hmm. and, and if there's one thing we should support, it is that you need to have the rule of law uh, as, as one certain principle, and the other that we are fundamentally against, against the, the death penalty, and that is in itself also to make sure that we need to use every resource to get our citizens back. And I think it's, it has been very fortunate that we made this. And then we have a dilemma. Not a dilemma, but it, it's, it's a, it will be a democratic struggle. Because on one hand, yes, we believe in the French Revolution that, uh, and that uh, human rights are definitely universal. And uh, I firmly believe that uh, the right to life is the, is a, 
a supreme a human right that cannot be challenged. But on the other hand, there's no doubt that in many areas, in many countries, the death penalty is quite popular. You have it in the States, in the US, where it's a, if you ask, there will be a majority that think that for certain crimes, it's still uh, something that they support. Uh, and that means that we have to work within democracies, we have to work in, in, uh, in a, a different way. And it's definitely those that finally decides whether it should be abolished or not, whether the scope should be, uh, should be limited or not, are parliamentarians. It is the lawmakers that finally decides the day when it will happen or not. Um, and I think, in, uh, like in the US, it's interesting because it's not, even on the, it's not in, even on the federal level, it's as much on the local level. Uh, and uh, there, are, there has been positive signs the last few years that more and more states have abolished the death penalty. But at the same time, we have a situation right now. I think it, only yesterday it went through the the to, 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 through not through Congress, but um, the House of Representatives. It went through this uh, thin blue line act, which means that uh, which means that uh, policemen or first responders if they are killed, no matter what reason, uh, they will be uh, eligible for uh, to, to put people in and give them a sentence to, to death and capital punishment. So that is one example. Whether it will go through whole con Congress, I don't know the situation. But it's definitely also uh, will be interesting and be important. Does Donald Trump and the Secretary of Justice, which wants a harder line, do they, will they strengthen uh, Republican governors when you come to the next elections? Or will they become a, or will they be a problem for the Republican governors when they come to the next elections? These things matter to, to which way uh, the debate about the death penalty will, will go, also in the US in the years ahead. And as parliamentarians, of course, we have to work with our own governments, but we can also use the networks among parliamentarians that are always there. I mean, we meet, our, we meet each other when we travel. We meet each other at international uh, organizations. As myself, I am also a member of the OSCE, OSCE, OSCE Parliamentary Assembly, where you, of course, have all these uh, informal and also formal discussions that is always there. And we work within our uh, party groups. Uh, we are part of the Aldi group, but also with the Liberal International, where you can also network and influence uh, uh, all the time. And of course, use that, in the old time, was uh, for politicians to use the salt box to stand up and, uh, and, uh, and really use your opinions. Uh, but of course, today too, you have to, we also have to have a strong voice for human rights, but also for the, the to abolish uh, the, the death penalty. Um, and as we are at the Italian Institute, I will I will end by a, a citation from Dario Fu, because I had a great pleasure in in 2010 when he was here in Oslo and at the City Hall, because I was also there, to have a full evening with Dario Fu, uh, debating both his views on communism back in the 1970s, and whether he still had that opinion, also in the view of 1989, the democratization uh, in the late years, and also on uh, the necessity or not for having to fight for freedom. This was back in 2010, so for both a pianist and a rector, were important issues. And Dario Fu was a great playwright also, I know, was in a fight for, uh, or with the Vatican, even, which is quite special for him, uh, back in 2000, trying to stop the execution of, uh, um, I don't know how to read, Rocco de Reg. Yeah, Rocco de Reg. Yeah, in Virginia. That ultimately it failed, but was a strong, 
was a strong uh, movement. And I also, when I look to, I look to the harshest regimes. I try to remember some certain things. Uh, like if you look at the Chinese as I started with, it is important. I think it's important because sometimes or many times, the world seems very stable. Just like back in 1985, no one can foresee 18, 1989 and the fall of the, of the Berlin Wall. And then I think it's important to remember that the Communist Party in the Soviet Union lasted for 72 years. And the Communist Party in China are now into the 67th. And then we'll see. And then I'll start to end up with Dario Fu that said, comedy makes the subversion of the existing state of affairs possible. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ura. And, uh, last but not least, uh, I'm glad to introduce a very young uh, scholar from the University of Oslo, uh, Sophie Hugestor. Thank you very much. I'm not sure if all my staff are getting more well taken. Good afternoon, I'm really thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for letting me step in on behalf of my good colleague, Jan, who would have loved to be here today. Um, unfortunately, he was abroad today. Um, my name is Sophie, I'm a PhD fellow at the Norwegian Centre for Human Rights, but I've also worked with human rights in Africa and Asia. And sort of capitalising on your uh, sunshine story, because I was uh, speaking with my grandmother the other day, and she feels that every time she reads my work or sees me on the, if I'm interviewed on the news, I'm always talking about sad things. You know, depressing things because of my research pertains to international criminal law. So most of what I talk about are war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. Um, and so today I thought I would try and put a bit of a positive spin on things. Um, I was asked to come and talk briefly about uh, the contribution of law to the promotion of human rights. I think the first thing that you have to say is that law isn't everything. You know, despite being a lawyer, you know, I freely admit that there are other institutions and mechanisms that have to come into play before human rights standards can really reach their peak potential. Um, before taking up my job at the university, I worked in Cambodia, um, where I was working uh, on the um, trials against the former leaders of Khmer Rouge uh, at the UN Tribunal for the Khmer Rouge. Um, I worked on the defense team. So defense teams at such tribunals are very pleased with human rights standards because you know that is what's keeping our clients from not getting that penalty. But while I was in Cambodia, I also taught human rights law at the University of Phnom Penh, uh, and I think you know I had really inspiring students. But it was I, you know I felt their physical discomfort with studying human rights law. It's hard to work with human rights uh, in a dictatorship, which is the situation that you have in Cambodia. And you know unfortunately, I see that. Some of the people I met while I was working there are now in prison for having conducted legitimate legal protests. And that is because despite the fact that Cambodia has human rights legislations on the books, they're not enforced. They don't have independent uh, judicial bodies that can enforce those mechanisms. And so law isn't everything. You need uh, to have the other democratic institutions in play. Having said that, when you have those things, you know, human rights law can be really transformative. And that brings me to my sunshine story, and I think the big sunshine story within my field of research and within human rights law, maybe, I would say maybe this decade, and that is the trial against Hassan Habre. I don't know if you've heard of Hassan Habre before he was dictator in Chad, and just three weeks ago he had um, a judgment upheld on appeal against him for crimes against humanity. He's now the first former head of state to be tried before the domestic courts of another country for crimes against humanity specifically for torture, primarily. You know, and that's a huge victory uh, for, for human rights. And I, I have a special relationship with the Hassan Habre trial insofar as I've been following it since 2005 when I was a, worked as a volunteer after high school in Senegal where the trial took place. And for those of you who haven't heard uh, of the long 26-year journey it took to bring Hassan Habre to trial, um, Hassan Habre was the dictator in Chad in the 1980s. And then he was deposed in, I think, 1990, at which point he um, uh, went into exile in Senegal, which is a lovely country, it's a wonderful coastline, 
where he lived in a wonderful palace for several years. Um, however, the victims of his regime, uh, particularly victims who spent time in those <coughs> torture centers, require justice. They demand the justice. And I think, you know, if you, if you try and imagine what it must have been like to be a torture victim in such a regime in the late 80s, early 90s, that was unfortunately not, it isn't today even, it's not an uncommon thing to have been. The idea that you were going to bring your forward dictator to justice in you know, 1990 must have seemed like an you know, obscene idea. Nevertheless, they persisted. They managed to uh, create a truth commission in Chad. That concluded in 1994 that there had been torture committed, systemic torture committed by the former regime. Um, and then they started slowly to try and bring um, proceedings against him in uh, Senegal by using the domestic courts. Now this was around 1998 when things really got uh, started and that was around the time for those who remember that of the Pinochet judgment in London which was a really important human rights judgment which essentially said that um, if you are a former head of state you are not immune for crimes of torture in front of the domestic courts of another country. But uh, unfortunately Pinochet was too sick to stand trial and so he was nevertheless never extradited to Spain where he was supposed to stand trial for having committed crimes of torture. And so, you know, despite having this victory, this case, this really important case law that you can try these people, uh, for even former heads of states, under the human rights law, um, that trial never took place. But what happened, you know, what that led to was that um, the victims in Chad called up Human Rights Watch, who had worked on this case at the time, and said, can you guys help us out? And Reed Brody, who was the uh, lawyer for Human Rights Watch, who's worked on this case since 1998, he said, sure, we'll give it a try. We could use the Pinochet judgment in Senegal. And so they actually, uh, together with law students, went to Chad. They physically uh, took out the files, the torture files, the evidence they could find there, bought it with them, and then they uh, tried to bring the case in front of, um, uh, in front of a judge, instructive judge, what they call it, in the French legal system in Senegal. Now the judge uh, in 2000, I believe, he said, yes, you know, we're going to investigate this. And he took out an indictment against uh, the former president, Habre, uh, on crimes against humanity. And at this point, of course, it got to be political. And the um, uh, Senegalese government uh, became uneasy with this. You know, Senegal is a democracy, but I think like a lot of democracies, you know, when you have a dictator and you're missed and you're asked to try and it's a very difficult process. You know, my field of study and what I research is how you, you know, how you create those justice mechanisms, you know, how you do that. And, and what happened, and it's a long, you know, it's a long 26 year story, but what happened was that the Supreme Court of Senegal said we don't have jurisdiction to try and for something that happened in Chad. And the story without human rights instruments would have ended there. But at that point in time, um, the lawyers at Human Rights Watch bought the case before the UN Committee of Torture and said that, you know, Senegal is a signature of the Convention Against Torture. And in that convention, you have a legal obligation to either extradite or prosecute uh, the person when they are in your country. And that starts with a 10 year legal battle over this one question. And in that time frame, Belgium tried to extradite Habre because you had former Chad victims of Hebrae in Belgium, so they tried to institute proceedings in Belgium as well, and they asked for his extradition from Senegal. Uh, and Senegal said no, still. And the case ended up going before the International Courts of Justice in 2008, and it was decided in 2011. And I think it's probably one of the easier questions, legal questions, the International Courts of Justice has had to decide, because that's what it says in the Torture Convention, you either have to extradite or you have to prosecute. And so Senegal was told that you have, this is your legal obligation, you either extradite them to Belgium or you try and suit yourself. And at that point in time, the African Union, which I think gets a lot of criticism, and fairly so, on, on issues of human rights, but here they really stepped up to the plate. Because they said, okay, then we have to find some sort of domestic mechanism that we can try them under. Uh, and they created the Extraordinary African Chambers within the local domestic courts of Cambodia. So it was like a special court within the domestic courts of Cambodia, sorry, Cambodia. The domestic courts of Senegal, that would never happen in Cambodia, unfortunately. The domestic courts of Senegal to try him within a Senegalese jurisdiction. Uh, and so you would have Senegalese lawyers, but you would have, have judges from the African Union. This has never been done before. Uh, you know, I find it incredibly interesting. I hope it's something I can study more after I'm done with my PhD on other international criminal courts. 
Uh, but uh, essentially, the trial started uh, a year and a half ago, um, which, you know, when I worked in, in Senegal in 2005, I never, never ever thought he was going to actually be brought to justice. And he was convicted last summer, in, again, the first time uh, in history that a former head of state has been convicted for human rights abuses that he committed against his own people in the state by the courts of another country. And what's so neat about this mechanism, the extraordinary African chambers, is that unlike a lot of international criminal courts, it's cheap. You know, international criminal proceedings cost millions of dollars. I mean, you know, I think in Cambodia you spent something along 120 million dollars to try and you know prosecute four people. Um, because unfortunately people like me cost money. Uh, but you know, if you try and do it locally, and, I, and I'm a big proponent of local justice mechanisms because it brings justice closer to the victims, and they are the people who should be in focus uh, in such proceedings. And by having in the Senegal uh, victims of the regime were able to come and testify. So the same victims <coughs> who started out this journey in the 1990s were able to come and uh, testify and essentially bring testimony and evidence that in the end convicted him. Uh, and his, um, that judgment was upheld on appeal three weeks ago. And I think that the whole saga of the Senate right, shows to me that once you get lawyers working together with civil society activists who work together with victims and use the legal avenues that we have created internationally in the last 50 years, you can really um, implement those standards that we speak about you know, when we speak about human rights in the most idealistic of senses. So on that note, thank you.